Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called One Last Job. It is an asymmetrical two-player game in which somebody's going to play as the mob and somebody's going to play as those stealing from the mob. In the game, you're going to get your own set of cards, your own deck of cards. You're going to be drawing from that deck and playing cards down in order to try and steal from different locations on the board. You're going to be trying to uh, avoid guards, avoid snags, and avoid locks as the uh, person stealing from the mob. And the mob is trying to secure locations by not allowing the person who's trying to steal from them to get them. This is one last job to secure all the money you need, and the mob is not going to allow that to happen if possible. It's a game that's similar to a game like Android Netrunner, in which you're going to have to try and go through different security systems to get the items you're going to want to get and the victory points needed to succeed. Let's go ahead and show you the game one last job and how to play it. So here we have the game One Last Job and all the components in the game. As you see, there are two separate decks, one's for the Dawn, one's for the Thieves, and everybody's gonna start with five cards in their hand. The Thieves are gonna get their hideout, and the Dawn is gonna get his office. He's also gonna start with the character, the Dawn, which will be used to move to different locations to place influence on them. The beginning of the game, everybody has their five cards, and the Dawn is going to start. At the beginning of every Dawn's turn, they're gonna simply take a location and place it on the board, provided there is three, uh, less than three. When they go ahead and place their location, on the board, they're going to then add these cards, and these are going to be basically guards, snags, locks, and then of course the victory resolution cards. You're going to take uh, uh, the different numbers here. This is one guard, this is two locks, and this is one of the snags, and you're going to then place them face down along with having the Don draw two of these, choose one of them, and put it in the deck of cards. You're then going to take this deck and you're going to shuffle it up just like this, and then you're going to place it on the location, which is where the thieves are going to try and go to to try and steal from. Now, that when they try and steal from this location, if they ever draw the resolution card, they're going to score victory points, and these are going to show you that you're going to win the game. This is how you win the game here, is getting victory points. And you're going to need a certain amount of them in order to win. You're going to need, I believe, seven victory points in order to win. After that, then the Dawn is going to simply get to draw a card from the deck here, and they're going to be able to play up to five actions. Now, I'm using these tokens here, but they're actually timed tokens, but just so you get, I have an idea of how many actions I have left, I'm using these. Time tokens will insinuate how long uh, cards are going to last for. These are locks and these are guard tokens you'll place on certain cards. This is going to be the threat level, which will increase as the cards get um, taken over by different players, as well as other cards are going to increase the threat level. And finally, this is the influence the Dawn has. Now, the objective of the Dawn is to place down cards, such as actors. He'll place actors face down, and he'll also be able to place complications. These are separate cards. You only have one of each in each location, whereas event cards will be placed face up. Now the reason why he's going to be wanting to do this using his actions, each card is going to have a certain action count on there, like this is going to cost two, this will cost one, here's another three, this is an X based on the X value on the card, is so that way that the bad, the good guys, or the thieves, are going to try and go here and steal, but they're going to have to go through all this as well as the different cards they draw from. Now as the Dawn, there's a couple actions you can take, you can simply choose to take one action to move an influence from an office to a location, provided the Dawn is there, or add an influence to an office with this, you're also going to be able to play cards from your hand, and then of course moving the Dawn as an action. So for one action I can simply put an influence on here, then for another action I can move the Dawn here, and, and then for another action I can spend one to uh, move an influence onto this location. The Dawn is going to secure locations when he has enough meeples equal to the resolution's uh, point count. So this is five here, if he ever has five on here he's going to just get this card, and that's going to take away from the uh, good guy there, or the, or the thief, depending on how you look at things I guess. And that will score points for the Dawn, whereas the good guy is just going to go out on missions to try and secure the card. Now with his remaining two actions, he might want to play a card face down, like let's say he wants to play Jimmy. And this says, at the start of an operation here, raise the threat level by one, unless the operator, this guy over here, is going to pay um, one of these uh, these uh, guard tokens here. He has to have one. So that would be a good option. Another one would be Birdie. This is a complication that goes face down. That says, when discovered, raise the threat level by one, which just means put one of these cards out here. And uh, then you're going to have to go ahead and trash this thing. Whenever you trash something, you get rid of it. And then let's see if we have anything else here. We have a password reset. This one says for three actions, you can go ahead and uh, re uh, attach it to a scene. So you attach it just like that. And then it says at the start of an operation here, stop the operation unless he has two locks. If he ever does have two locks, this is going to get trashed. If not, the operation is instantly going to be stopped. And so that's a good useful card. But unfortunately, we didn't have enough actions for that. We just had enough for Jimmy. So Jimmy's going to go ahead and go face down. When he runs out of uh, actions, then it's going to be the next player's turn. I guess you can go ahead and refresh the action so he knows for his next turn. This player is going to go ahead and draw his card. This player is going to also be able to do the similar actions. He's going to be able to play operators. 
that are going to, um, like here's one, an operator. This is the sneak. He's going to cost three actions here. And then it's gonna, it says here, you can enhance the sneak by attaching a copy of itself to uh, uh, from from your hand. So he's going to be cheaper for if he has in your hand. And then it says enhance the sneak skill cap is increased by two of these guys here. So that's really useful. For one action, he can send this guy over here. And for another action, he can simply choose to draw cards from the stack, draw a card from the stack here, go on a mission basically, and pull a card. He'd pull one, and this one says lock. Basically, if he doesn't have a lock, he's gonna stop the operation, it will basically end. And in which case, he's not gonna be able to perform another one unless he goes ahead and uses another action. Or if he actually had one of these things from one of the cards he had gone ahead and placed, he would actually be able to use the token, get rid of this card, and then draw again. So if he picked another card here. Oh, here's a snag. Now the snag here says you're gonna discover a complication. Um, and if there's no complication there, he's going to discover the top of the card of the deck and uh, look at that. This is a complication, so it would actually go into play and this would be discovered. And it would say, uh, when it's discovered, trash a random operative unless he's able to play two eyeballs, which he wouldn't be. Um, as well as whenever he goes to a location, this guy will pop up, the uh, Jimmy, the actor, and he'll have to do this as well. The start of the operation and raise the threat level, so he has no eyeball, so that would go up. Um, and this will stay here. It's pretty useful here, right? Uh, but basically the idea is he's trying to pull from here. If he's able to pull this card, he's going to instantly secure it. This whole thing is going to go away. Everybody's going to go back and reset. And he's going to gain two victory points. If not, however, everything is going to stay the same and the game is going to continue back and forth. Now, remember, he doesn't necessarily, this is not something he would normally do for the first turn. He's going to want to secure uh, the ability to be able to go to these locations. So maybe he's going to want to use this whispering earrings. It says it, it cannot be unequipped outside of the hideout. And uh, for one action, fill one skill point on the Whispering Earring. So it can actually give you skill points to be able to break these things, right? You've got the Yerba Mate, which is place six counters on it. And when you play it, and at the start of a turn, remove one counter to fill a skill point on it. So that's pretty useful as well. Uh, and then you got, of course, other operatives. And here's another event. Choose a scene and reveal one face down card from that scene for each operative there. So if this card was face down, he can move this guy here, flip this over for one action point to see what it is to determine whether or not he wants to actually go and deal with this, this high out right and so then it's going to go to the next player and it's going to continue to go just like that you're going to draw a card i think you can also use actions to draw cards from the deck but you're going to also flip over one of these guys again here's three more guards they're going to be added as well as one more snag and then of course the don will draw two and pick one here's a four and here's a set okay so they're both pretty much the same he'll go ahead and pick this one shuffle them up once again and continue the game runs similar to uh netrunner because you're going to be trying to have the operative come here and secure these things and the don is going to try and not allow that to happen by placing face down complications or simply by placing face up event cards. He's gonna be using his actions to do so, all while at the same time moving his Dawn around the board, paying the different uh, costs associated and also putting influence from his office onto the locations. If he's able to secure enough uh, influence on a location, he'll score the point. Whereas the other guy is simply going to be drawing cards from that location to try and pull the card he needs without having to deal with the locks, snags, and guards. And hopefully he has all the cards he's played down um, in order to basically spend the cost so he can continue his operation and not have it end because that's going to cost him a lot of points in the end. And that's the basic idea of the game, One Last Job. There's a couple other cards we want to talk about as well as some different locations and how they work. Let's go ahead and go above and talk about that as well as review the game. So a couple caveats before we get into discussing the game when I think about it. Uh, clarification should I, say, I should say. First of all you can have as many actors as you want. That's why you have to separate between actors and the complications. You can have as many complications as you want but only one face down at a time. So you can't place more than one face down complication in each location. But once they get flipped over if they haven't been removed on your next turn you can simply put another one face down. All, uh, you can have as many actors as you want on different locations but they start face down they get flipped over and they work very similar to the other players, this guy here, uh, the operatives. So actors are similar in which they can go ahead and move from location to location. And just like the operatives, if a actor uh, location gets taken by the other player, this will actually go back to your hand so you can go ahead and use him again. So Jimmy might be uh, not so useful in one location. He can come up and go back and be used again. Um, as well as threat level. Threat level is going to entertain the po possibility of additional cards in the uh, Dawn's deck of being useful. It's a way of increasing the difficulty of the other player with with the Dawn being able to use more uh, difficult tactics throughout the game. If a crew attempts an operation on the next turn, raise the threat level by one. Um, and there's cards in here that say, based on the level of threat, uh, what you can actually do with the cards. Here, play re play uh, Retribution, only if the threat level is four or higher, trash an operative for three. So you can simply remove one of the other player's operatives from the board, which is very, very, very powerful. Um, the way the game works is very similar to Android's Netrunner, the living card game, in which you're going to have one player, the 
runner trying to go through these different locations and secure corporation points. Uh, in this game, it looks very similar in that aspect, but there's some differences. Being able to use multiple different characters around the board, as well as the style of cards in your hand, they're not ne they aren't necessarily similar in certain ways, but in other ways, they kind of equip to certain players, and they can be used to stop or to have benefit you, depending on the type of player you are. The locations are kind of randomized, and they don't matter as much as far as what they do, unless they add abilities on them, which they haven't yet. What matters more is actually the locks, the guards, and the snags. And snags are interesting because if you have a complication on one of the locations, you can simply flip that over. If you don't, you're going to take the top card of the deck. What I would like to see as part of the review here is actually a way in which you can kind of use the Dawn's cards to influence the top of the Dawn's deck, so you can kind of put complications on top there, making it a little cheaper. When we played this game, we played it multiple times, it seemed like the the, uh, the thief was a little bit easier to play. So if you're going to be a beginner, it's probably something you'd want to play as the thief because you're simply going to be pulling cards from here and you might end your operation, you might not. But if you get lucky enough, you can easily win the game just by simply pulling those resolution cards. Technically, you can win the game just by being the thief and collecting three of them. You get like a three, a four, and a two, and that'll be enough for seven. And that would be enough to win the game for you. However, that uh, Dawn is going to make it very difficult using complications and actors and events to stop you or prevent you from being able to do it in the first place. In which case you're going to use to build your tableau as the thieves right so it has that differentiation between the games and they're both very similar in ways that if you like the style of android netrunner you're also going to like the style of one last job it's also a more confined game there's no deck building involved it all comes uh, standardized and the amount of actions is the same as well um, and you're trying to pull influence on your uh, location, which is interesting. And you bring the Dawn over to the location, and it has a thematic aspect of, I'm influencing this location to give me its its power or its um, resolution stage to give you these, these gems. They're so basically currency. You're trying to score points throughout the game. But uh, I can see how it can be difficult. The Dawn is going to be a little more challenging to play, and you need to make sure you play the right cards in the right locations, and that runner is just going to be going and trying to pull from you, and you're like, no, I'm not going to allow you to do it. And so tensions can raise high, just like an Android network runner. So overall, the game's really nice. There's not a lot of artwork here present, or there's not any artwork here present, but if you go on the Kickstarter campaign, you can see it, and the artwork there is fantastic. So definitely go ahead and check out this game. If you think it's a game you're going to like, it's a two-player style living card game-esque to, uh, I think, maybe a tribute to Android Netrunner in certain ways, but definitely different enough to where you might want to pick it up. All right, well, personally, I enjoyed the game, and I think you're going to like it as well if you enjoy, what, like I said, what I was talking about before, the Android Netrunner style theme. Do go ahead and check out the game. One last job, if it sounds like something you'd be interested in as well in the description below.